Good morning, everybody. My name is Bob McGoy. I'll be your host and chat monitor for this morning on this webcast about doing sand castings with Stratasys Polyjet technology. Our presenter today is Tim Crinnan from our Denver facility. Um, he's got some really good information to share with us today. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tim Crinnan, and thank you very much for joining us for our presentation. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending. This is going to be, yeah, Stratasys uh, and how you can use it in sand casting. It's going to be a, a general overview of, you know, where you can people use uh, sand casting, how it's done now, ways that FDM and uh, Stratasys stuff can help supplement that, and, uh, you know, the specific benefits you can get from there. So we'll just go ahead and jump on into this. It's not going to be, uh, you know, an all-day presentation or anything. It'll be pretty quick. So sand casting is, uh, you know, it's used all over, and it's uh, used in place of, you know, die casting or investment casting if your parts are more too complex to do, like, die casting on or you're doing a whole lot of them, so you don't want to do an uh, investment casting one, you can crank them out in the sand casting method. Um, and if, if you're doing this in-house, you need, you know, a lot of uh, ancillary equipment to help support the whole sand casting process. You're going to need some sort of pattern shop or some way to make your patterns. You're going to need your operation section for, you know, melting your vats of molten metal so you can actually pour them into your molds. And then, you know, cold assurance in the end to see how those castings turned out. And depending on what they're used for, they can, you know, different levels of um, inspection you're going to need on all that stuff. So, I mean, this is used in industries from, you know, pretty much across the board, aerospace, agriculture, customer goods, defense, uh, industrial equipment. So, you know, you're going to have different, you know, quality requirements for if you're making an agricultural uh, metal thing to, you know, hold some in place versus if it's going to be on the back of a, a missile or something. You really don't want to have any voids in your part. So the traditional process of sand casting, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Start out by having a, a pattern. So there's a couple different types of patterns you can make. You can do match plates, split pattern, loose patterns, um, all depending on what you need from it. But you, you're going to have that made up. So you're going to start with your CAD file. You're going to make, a, you know, the split line, cut it in half, build it into a match plate, have runner systems and everything built into it so you can actually have multiple parts come off of one pour so you're not just doing singles on as your parts are small enough to accompany that. And then you're going to uh, go ahead and make your, uh, you know, both sides of that. So you have your cope side and your drag side. Um, and then you're going to compact your sand and everything into that to actually uh, build up the, you know, shapes. So you, what you do with your match plate is you have your specific um, green sand or other different types of chemical sand you can do where you just ram the uh, shape of your part into the sand or the sand down around your part, and it just leaves the impression of what you want there left behind with a nice firm packed sand mold there to hold your tolerances and your surface finish and everything. So then once you make uh, both sides compacted together, uh, we're going to go ahead and do our... Um, you know, assemble your mold so things, you have your top and bottom bolted together. Um, you know, one side specifically going to have the entrance for pouring your hot liquid metal into. And that's going to go in. You have additional risers and things in there to accommodate shrinkage and all that fun stuff. And then once the uh, metal cools down, it's, you know, buried in this block of sand that's very firmly packed, and then you just need a break the sand apart, throw it onto a vibratory bed or something, jiggle off all the sand, and you end up with your tree of metal parts in the end. Then you just take those, cut off the runners and the gates, reuse that metal, and finish your parts up all nice, prim, and proper. So, I mean, that's, that's a pretty quick overview of how sand casting works. So, where Stratasys can actually be used um, in this process is the basically for replacing the uh, the match plates and the runners and risers and all that stuff. So, you know, it's not a, a perfect fit for everyone. It depends what you're doing. If you're doing from, you know, somewhere around 5,000 uh, castings or something or around there or less, uh, FDM works really great for this. So you can actually make up your match plates and stuff with FDM printers directly. 
Um, it helps alleviate bottlenecks in your pattern creation process because it can be you know, a pretty long, drawn-out process making good patterns uh, from solid metal. So it has, requires a lot of post-processing and extra machining work, especially if you have any complex designs or anything going on in there. And then if, uh, you know, it's really, um, the more complex and organic the features, the better 3D printing is going to be for that instead of machining because, you know, that's one of the great things about 3D printing is that they don't care about the complexity of your geometry anymore, right? It just cranks out your part and it doesn't directly associate to how much it's going to cost. Versus when you're milling something, uh, the more work it has to do, the more rotations and refixtures and all that stuff and inside geometries it has to try and get to or it just can't get to, um, you know, directly relates to how much it's going to cost to make the part. And you can also do, uh, it's great for doing a, a gates and runners systems where you can just customize those and print those parts off so you can swap them out and change them a lot more frequently and, you know, try new or different designs really easily. So this is kind of, you know, showing it's great for the more complex the design is, the more this is going to be a, uh, a savings and a benefit to get into with uh, FDM versus if you just have super simple stuff, like super simple geometry, you can machine those out of metal and it's really quickly and it's not too much of an issue. But, yeah, the more complex it is and the more crazy geometry you got going on, the, the easier it is to uh, get into the FDM side of it. So the saying that it's great for the FDM drone here is the uh, match plates and, uh, you know, the different patterns and resin pattern masters, all that stuff. You can just straight 3D print now instead of having to machine the whole thing. You can even do core boxes and uh, interchangeable gate and runner systems. So you can try different runners because it's kind of going to be broken up on the, uh, the pattern match plate on, like, each side, and then the runner down the middle for how it actually splits off the uh, metal to pour down into those. So you can try different geometries and, you know, fine-tune, optimize just really quickly by cranking out those runner systems on a 3D printer. So it makes, you know, a lot lower cost for actually acquiring these patterns and doing different iterations um, while it can, you know, withstand all your the, the issues in that process where you have, you know, high ramming forces and it's going to be really abrasive and you have all the sand stuff in there rubbing against stuff. So you can make... Uh, you know, the core boxes and the runner systems and some of those pictures. So where this is a good fit in the process is when, yeah, you have your 5,000 or less parts, um, you know, the, the pattern is going to fit on whatever FDM system you either have already in-house or you're thinking about getting. And those can go pretty big, but you can also get really large, uh, you know, patterns made too. It's possible to, you know, print it in sections and, you know, hook them together, but that just ends up adding more post-processing work, which starts getting you closer towards, like, okay, well, let's just do the whole thing out of metal. Um, and then with the pressures, depending on what material you run, uh, can easily resist those ramming forces. So if you're just doing straight ABS on, like, a Fortis, uh, you know, 270 printer or something, <laughs> you can print the part out of ABS solid, and uh, it can resist ramming forces up to 3,000 PSI for ABS, typically. Uh, other options is you could print the uh, match plates out of polycarbonate. And those can get up to, um, I want to say, about 6,000 PSI. Or if you have one of the big forest machines, you could print the material out of Altem, which is a very strong, durable, rigid plastic. And that can actually resist forces up to about 10,000 psi. So depending on the pressures of your specific operation, the geometry is how deep it's got to, you know, compact it and all that fun stuff. Um, you, you know, choose the right material for the job. You don't really want to overkill it every time. And make it out of all ten. It also makes the post processing a little bit more arduous if you make it out of all ten because it's a much more firm, resilient material. And so when you have higher, moderate to high complexity parts. Again, it's another area where it's, uh, you know, FDM. 3D printing in general is going to specialize because you don't have anything holding you back. And then, you know, you, you need to have access, accessibility to the actual pattern geometry. So when it comes out of the machine, um, you know, everybody knows the FDM style. You kind of have that, like, uh, fingernail file finish on the outside. So you're going to need to do a lot of post-processing to that 
after the fact to really sand it down, smooth it out, and get a nice smooth surface. So it leaves a nice compaction into the sand and also doesn't have any sand particles and stuff, you know, adhered to those little nooks and crannies on there. So you have to sand it down, polish it, smooth it. Um, so even with all that factored in to the FDM process, it ends up being dramatically cheaper and quicker still to make it on that style. Typically, when people bring this in-house, they're seeing uh, benefits of, you know, the lead time to getting the match plates, like, in-house and up and running, and starting using them, 30 to 70 percent time savings. And with a uh, 60 to 80 percent, you know, cost savings by not having to have them giant things machined out of uh, metal. And then you really improve the efficiency in our, you know, the pattern making process that reduces the load on your workshop. So if you have CNC labs going on in there, milling up a bunch of stuff, this helps uh, lower the load on those. So freed up for other things, catch up in the backlog they might have going on. And, you know, keeps all the pattern making in house and keeps it a, uh, you know, very uh, proprietary process because, you know, uh, information you send out, you know, it's always, you're like, okay, don't tell anyone about this, and, you know, hopefully that all works out and everybody follows along with you. And, you know, it gives you a lot of flexibility. So the, uh, you know, modifying your part and, you know, saying, oh, okay, that didn't work great, let's try a different component, let's do interchangeable components. Um, so when you have all the, the mash plates and the runner systems and the risers all separate pieces, you can try different geometries much more quickly and easily in-house without having to worry about, oh, okay, is this going to be worth the effort? Like, it, it casts okay. Um, what if we try a different design? Okay, now we have to, for a runner, now we have to go have that machined out again, wait another couple days for it to come back before we can try our new option. Now you can just 3D print it, have it going, you know, hours later, and try some different options without having to uh, sit there and say, okay, is this going to be worth the effort of trying to optimize the process more? And, you know, there's the little things like riser designs and stuff, so, for the materials coming out. So, an example of a company that has done a really good job with this was the, uh, was the Melron Corporation. So, they actually make all kinds of handles for, like, doors and windows and stuff. And, you know, things with doors and window handles, there's lots of different designs for those. So, not only do they have to make, you know, a set of match plates, for, you know, it's two match plates for, you know, the cope and drag side, top and bottom, for each specific geometry of handle they have. Um, that ends up being, you know, a whole lot of ones. And if you, you're not, they're not going to be running, and because they have so many different designs, you're not going to be running such super high volume on each one, other than, you know, I'm sure the occasional best sellers. But when you have all these different designs, you're not doing fall, like, you know, 100,000 on every set of match plates you got. So when they brought this in-house, compared to CNC machining, you know, was, when they CNC a match plate out of metal, it took them about $5,000 and three to four weeks before they'd get it up and running. When they looked to uh, FDM tooling for the match plates, it dropped the cost from $5,000 down to $2,000 and, you know, a week and a half. So it was a, uh, you know, it's a savings of $3,000 in, you know, one to two and a half weeks of uh, time before you actually start getting those parts out. So and you see the price in there, $2,000 for a match plate. Like, that's not how much it costs to 3D print. That's factoring in all the post-processing you would need to do for these parts. So once you print it off and you have that rough surface finish, okay, now we got to sand it down, we got to prime it, we got to, you know, get the ready for the mold release and all that fun stuff. And the materials that we've printed this out of can withstand the abrasion, can withstand the chemicals we're dealing with for mold release or stuff that you might have within your uh, mixtures of your sand. And uh, so with all that factored in, you know, it's a $2,000 part. So it's still really big cost savings on there. And now when they have to do a different set of match plates for every type of handle, and they're saving $3,000 per set of match plates, it ends up adding up really quick for them. So it is also great for if you need to, you know, verify uh, casting designs too, um, where you're like, okay, I think this is going to work. Um, you can when you print it out, you have a much lower risk involved in there to say, like, okay, is this new design going to work? Did I set the runners up properly? Now you don't have to uh, say, oh, well, now we got to machine up a whole new set because that one failed. So cost of errors are much lower, too. 
But yeah, I mean, that's just a, it's a really quick, uh, rough overview of uh, sandcasting where FDM can uh, get in on that. PolarJet can also be used for doing this stuff too. The, it can't go as high as compaction forces as, you know, Altem or polar carbonate. You're going to be down around the uh, 3,000 range. But one of the advantages for PolyJet is that you end up with much uh, smoother parts straight out of the machine. So it requires a lot less post-processing. Um, it's just going to have different uh, chemical resistances and stuff on it, too. So it all depends what you have in-house already, what size build chambers you need for making these plates, and all the other stuff. So that is just our quick overview. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to uh, throw out into the chat about some specific for green sand casting or other casting operations? Um, and this is a bit different than the, uh, you know, one of the other things that people do use uh, FDM printers for is investment casting. Uh, so that's where you'd print your part out of, a, you know, hollow, really hollow out of the ABS material, do your slurry over mold on the outside, and then you just burn out the inside cavity, and then you can pour your metal into there and smash off your shell, and you end up with uh, one-time use um, investment cast parts straight off the uh, FDM machine, too. So uh, someone has a question of, you know, what's the difference between green sand and regular sand casting? So. Green typically is referring to there, there's a, there's moisture in the sand, so it actually has a, some moisture and some other components in there to help it hold its form. So if you just have like clay sand from the a sandbox and you try and compact it, it's not going to hold its shape or anything. So green sand has clay and water in it, so actually when you compact it down, it holds its shape very rigidly and quickly. So it's something actually when you're reusing sand, so when they throw it on the vibratory bed and shake off all the sand, they can reuse that sand. A lot of times they just have to uh, re-moisten it because, you know, when you pour molten metal in, a lot of it's evaporating off. So they add a little bit extra water to it, mix it back up, and then they can uh, sift it out and then reuse that sand. And so the green helps keep it, uh, you know, hold its shape and compact better. It's not a lot of moisture, but, you know, it's enough to hold its shape. Uh, another version of green sand casting is where they actually have a chemical set sand. So they actually mix in like a, uh, you know, almost like a glue-like kind of mixture into the uh, sand. So then when they pack their, uh, you know, coke and drag into it, uh, it's actually then sets rigidly via a chemical reaction. And then those are used for if you have like much finer detail parts typically or if you have like you're putting cores and cavities into your green sand setup or into your sand casting setup also, and that lets you get much like smaller parts without having as much worry of the sand collapsing on you or something when it's being poured through. Well, Tim, I think we I think we've exhausted the questions for this morning. I'd I'd like to thank you very much for spending the time with us this morning and showing us some really good information on how we can leverage Stratasys with doing sand casting. I think that's pretty some awesome material. So um, if anybody has any questions, you've got Tim's email there on the screen. Um, you can also ask questions of myself, Bob M at CETI.com. And we'd like to thank you for spending your time with us today.